Ha Ko. This is Module 6, Famous Rock Structures of Hawaii and Across Oceania. In today's lecture, we will learn about rock structures and their importance to the people of Hawaii and the islands across Oceania. We will look specifically at Kapaimahu, Kukani Loko, Kaneaka Holua, Heao in Kahalu'u, the Moai of Rapa Nui, Marae Tapu Tapua Tea in Ra'ia Tea, and Nanmanduo. It is impossible for us to cover all of the important rock structures across Oceania. However, this will provide you an introduction and hopefully inspire you to learn more about the importance of Pohaku to the people and the island people of Oceania. As a reminder, quiz six is due Tuesday, October 3rd at 12 a.m. Let's begin first with Napuhaku o Ola, Kapaimahu a Kapuni. If you've ever made it down to Waikiki, you may have come across these Pohaku. They are located in between the police station and the Duke Kahanamoku statue. This week and this week only, I will give you five points extra credit to visit Napohaku Ola Kapai Mahu Akapuni and take a photo of one of the four Pohaku. Upload your photo to La Lima and include the name of your photo of the Pohaku. Um, you can upload your extra credit assignment under the assignments tab. Look for an assignment with the name Kapai Mahu. And again, be sure to include the name of the individual Pohaku. We're going to learn the names in subsequent slides. So the Mo'olalo of Kapai Mahu is based upon a handwritten manuscript of a story conveyed by James Alapuna Harbato Boyd, a colonel of the Hawaiian kingdom and a confidant of Queen Liuokalani. It was published in 1907 with the Hawaiian title Kapuhaku Kahuna Kapai Mahu, The Healer Stones of Kapai Mahu, and the English title Tradition of the Wizard Stones of Kapai Mahu. The Mo'olalo shows, says that four Tahitian healers traveled to Hawaii from their home on the island of Ra'iatea. The healers were Mahu, extraordinary individuals of dual male and female mind, heart, and spirit. They were beloved by the people for their gentle ways and their fame spread as they traveled throughout the islands administering their miraculous cures. When it was time to depart, they were asked that they asked that two stones be placed at their residence and two at their bathing place in the sea as a permanent reminder of the relief of pain and suffering from their ministrations. Four huge stones were quarried from the vicinity of the bell rock in Kaimuki and transported to Waikiki on the night of Kane. The healers transferred their names and spiritual powers to the stones, placing mahu idols under each one. Tradition states that incantations, fastings, and prayers lasted a full cycle of the moon. Then the healers vanished and were seen no more. This week, I want you to all watch the animated short film Kapai Mahu at the link below this movie was also an exhibit at Bishop Museum and converted into a children's book. So who are these pohaku? In subsequent slides, we will learn about the four healers and their pohaku. Here is an image of Kapai Mahu. Kapai Mahu is, a chief of, is the chief of the pohaku. They are healers who cast aside sexual feelings as a physician, treating either sex. The pohaku of Kapai Mahu is an estimated five tons. Here's an image of Kapai Mahu on the right and Kapuni on the left. Kapuni is a healer who envelopes patients with mana, with its spiritual powers to overcome illness. Kapuni is estimated at seven and a half tons. Kapuni is also the name of the surf break just offshore. 
Kahalua, or long breath, is a healer who breathes life into the patients. Kahalua is approximated at six tons. Kinohi is referred to as a healer who is all seeing, a dietitian. Kinohi is approximately four and a half tons. Here's another view of Kinohi. And here are Kapaimahu on the left, Kapuni in the center, and Kinohi on the right. Again, this is a reminder that you can earn up to five extra credit points this week and this week only by visiting these Pohaku in Waikiki and uploading a photo of either Kapaimahu, Kapuni, Kinohi, or Kahaloa to Laulima. Be sure to identify the name of the Pohaku when submitting your assignment. You may have noticed that in each slide, when introducing the names of the Pohaku, I also mentioned their weight. This is because these Pohaku are believed to have originated from an old quarry in Kaimuki. In this map, you will see that these Pohaku were hand carried nearly one and a half miles from the quarry to Waikiki Beach. And the old estimated location of the quarry is shown here on this map by this yellow circle. The old quarry is believed to have been located in the present location of Sacred Hearts. This area is located between Long's and Time's Shopping Center and Zippy's on Wailai Avenue. So next time you're driving down Wailai Avenue, take a look and keep a lookout for the school, um, Sacred Hearts, and imagine at that time that this was an old stone quarry. It will allow you to imagine the mound power that this would require to transport multiple rocks that are multiple tons from Kaimuki to Waikiki. Also imagine what the motivation must have been to do this. The healers were definitely revered and respected to have these Pohaku resurrected in their honor. The next site we're going to discuss is Kukani Loko. It's referred to as the birthplace of Ali'i or our Hawaiian chiefs of old. Kukani Loko is located in a five acre field at the intersection of Kamehameha Highway and Whitmer Avenue in Wahiawa, Oahu. Here's an image of the birthstones. The birthstones provided the strong support for mothers of Ali'i or royal children during childbirth. Positioned on a padded bed, bedstone leaning into the arms of her attendant as she braced against the backbone of Kukani Loko, the mother would ride the waves of pain with no outcry. Surrounding her were 36 Ali'i witnesses arranged on large stone placements in two rows of 18. Another 48 Ali'i would assist with the birthing protocols. Here is an image of another stone at, at Kukani Loko. Next, we will travel to Hawaii Island to the Ahupua'a of Keoho and Kahalu'u. During the pre-contact period, the Keoho Kahalu'u area was a major socio-political center of Hawaii. Keoho and Kahalu'u collectively represent an important and significant cultural landscape with over 30 named heiau and associations to many famous ali'i, including Umiali Loa or Kamehameha Ekahi, Kalamea the First. Today, the Vahipana ancestral sites within Keoho and Kahalu'u continue to be sources of inspiration. So if you take a look here at this map of Hawaii Island, it shows all of the Ahupua'a or traditional land divisions. If you go here to the west side of Hawaii Island to Kona, you will see that Keoho and Kahalu'u are located. Here is an aerial photo of Kaneaka Holua. This is the largest Holua or um, stone course, sliding stone course that is currently known. 
This stone course is used to he'eholua, where riders would slide down these pohaku on a Hawaiian sled. Kaneakua holua is constructed atop a bluff and kill hole named Pu'uo Kaomilao. Um, Henry Kikahuna, in his 1953 map of the holua slide, interprets the pu'u or name of the hill with as um, the hill with compressed sugarcane leaves. Additional reference to the use of the sugarcane on the holua slide is in Anolelo Noyao. Pua ke ko nei ika he'e holua, which roughly translates when the sugarcane tassels blooms, move to the sledding course. The tops of sugar canes were used as a slippery bedding for the sled to slide on. So what is he'e holua? The word he'e refers to sliding or riding as found in the term he'e nalu to surf. The word holua may refer to sliding in pairs or tandem. Holua also refers to the synergy of all components, the, slide, the sled, the rider, and the course. When sliding down the slope, amazingly he'eholua riders were also known to stand on their papa or their sleds like surfers on a wave. So here you'll see Pohaku, he's standing here with his sled as well as attempting to stand up and ride the he'eholua. Next we're going to watch this video which shows aerial image of Kaneakoholua and gives you an idea of just the extent of this he'eholua as well as how dangerous it might have been um, to attempt to he'e or slide. So if we listen to one of the mo'olelo, one account attributes the construction of the holua and kia ho by Kamehameha Pa'ea to commemorate the birth of Kawi Keauli, his second eldest son with his wahine ali'i keopuo lani. On March 17, 1814, near the shores of Keoho Bay, Kawi Keauli was born without signs of life. The kohuna nui, Kapihe took the lifeless newborn and resurrected him through prayers and by heating the still attached placenta over fire. He'eholua was a spectacle enjoyed across the Pai'aina or the um, archipelago of Hawaii by both ali'i and commoners alike. In some setting, bets and wagers are placed on the skill of the rider on the odds of completing the course unscathed. The ritual was performed by both male and female deities and ali'i such as Pele, and ali'i nui kanemua o hokena. One of the largest accounts of holua riding is documented by Toketa, a Tahitian visitor who witnessed the crowds gather around the holua kahua in Kahalu'i during his visit in May 1822. Today, at least 36 kahua holua are found across the five largest islands of Hawaii, Maui, Oahu, Kauai, and Molokai. Through des the design of each course, though the design of each course was unique, all courses were constructed upon a natural slope that were modified to enhance the ride. Preparations for the holua kahua required additional resources, lau ki, lau hala, or hala leaves and tea leaves, pili grass, sugarcane tops, or volcanic ash were placed upon the surface of the kahua while the runners of the sled were oiled with kukui nut or other vegetable oils. These efforts would reduce surface resistance and afford holua to reach speeds up to 40 miles per hour. This was a great exhibition of speed and control, sometimes also resulting in unfortunately death. Also located within Keho Kahalu'i are over 30 heiau. As you recall from last week's lecture, heiau are places where people worship traditional Hawaiian akua gods and amakua family gods. Heiau help to strengthen the relationships of people to these gods. Because the gods are part of nature, heiau strengthen people's relationship also to the environment. The gods oversee various activities and so prayers at heiau may be given to be more successful in an activity.
o ka halu'u ka kahi o na halau lolo, ka halu'u a, a place of intelligence. So as a part of your field trips for this class, we're going to have one virtual field trip at Kahalu'u, Hawaii Island. Here you'll explore the heiau of Hapaiali'i, Ke'eku, and Kapua Noni heiaus. Next, we're going to watch this short video to learn about Hapaiali'i heiau, one of the heiau at Keho. Here, Anakala Mahelani Pai, a cultural resource manager for this area, explains how this heiau and alignment of Pohaku were used to observe seasonal movements of the sun. So take a look at this video shown here at this YouTube link. You're going to have a question um, on your quiz related to this video. Next, we are going to explore outside of Hawaii and head to Rapa Nui, one of the most famous and isolated islands in the world. For many years, the construction and movement of Moai, shown here in this image, baffled Western society. In fact, Westerners wrongfully attributed the environmental collapse of the island to the construction and movement of the Moai because they just couldn't understand how these massive stones could be transported over long distances. But Western perspective in that story is another story for another time. Moai were symbols of authority and power and repositories of sacred spirit. Moai are a representation of the ancient Polynesian ancestors. Moai typically face away from the ocean and towards the villages as if to watch over the people. The exception is of seven, uh, of seven moai at Ahu Akiwi, which face out to the sea to help travelers find the island. The more recent moai have a pukao on their head, which represents a top knot, so shown here in this image. According to the people of Rapa Nui, the mana is, or the spiritual power of a person is preserved in their hair. The pukao were carved out of red scoria a very light rock from a quarry at Punapau. Red itself is also considered a sacred color. The Adipukau suggests a further status to the Moai. So here in this image is Rana Raku. It is a volcanic crater formed of consolidated volcanic ash, tuff, and is located on the lower slopes of Terevaka, a mountain of Rapa Nui. Rano Raraku is a quarry that was used for about 500 years until, until the early 18th century and supplied the stone from which about 95% of the islands known Moai were carved. Moai were carved in place at the quarry, shown here in this image, and they were then transported to where they were resurrected or erected vertically. Ranaraku is a visual record of Moai design, vocabulary, and technological innovation, where 887 Moai remain. It is also a World Heritage Site within the Rapa Nui National Park. Um, I was able to visit Rapa Nui years back and visit this quarry, and it's just absolutely amazing. If you ever get the chance to go to Rapa Nui, I would definitely uh, recommend visiting this place. The incomplete statues in the quarry are remarkable both for their number, for their inaccessibility of some that were high on the outside crater wall, and for the size of the largest at 71 feet in height, almost twice that of any moai that were ever completed and weighing an estimated 270 tons, many times the weight of any transported. Some of the incomplete moai seem to have been abandoned after the carvers in encountered inclusions of very hard rock in the material. Others may be sculptures that were never intended to be separated from the rock from which they were carved. On the outside of the quarry are a number of moai, some of which are partially buried to their shoulders in the, in the soil from the quarry. 
They are distinctive in that their eyes were not hollowed out. They do not have hukau, and they were not cast down during the island's civil wars. For this last reason, they supplied some of the most famous images of the island. Want to learn more about the Moai of Rapa Nui? Complete um, the virtual field trip really called Moai of Rapa Nui. Um, it can be found here as this link. Next, we will head to Ra'iatea and learn more about Marae Tapu Tapu Atea. Marae is a religious site and Marae Tapu Tapu Atea is one of the most sacred sites across all of Polynesia. So shown here in this image is the island of Ra'iatea and Marae Tapu Tapu Atea is located here in the image. If you take a look at this map known as Fe'e Fe e Nui, you will see that Ra'iatea was the ancient name for Hawaii, located here at the center of this Fe'e or octopus. Ra'iatea um, is also the site of Tapu Tapu Atea, a highly sacred religious site associated with voyaging governance and Eastern Polynesian chiefly lineages. The Fe'e or He'e in Hawaiian is a metaphor for Ra'iatea as the center of a cultural alliance consisting of island groups that are under the influence of its radiating tentacles, the northernmost extremity extending to Hawaii. You can see the other tentacles extend to Samoa, Tonga, Aotearoa, Rapa Nui, Marquesas, and many other islands across Oceania. In voyaging traditions, Ra'iatea and Tapu Tapu Atea are believed to be the origin of many of the original migrations of our people. Here are a few more images of Marae Tapu Tapu Atea. In addition to being built of pohaku, as you can see, numerous pohaku here in this image, this place also practiced the act of gifting pohaku. Pohaku from Tapu Tapu Atea have been used to establish new temples of the same name throughout Polynesia, including Tapu Tapu Atea in Tahiti, in the Tuamotus, Cook Islands, as well as Hawaii. Want to learn more about Tapu Tapu Atea? Complete the virtual field trip of Marae Tapu Tapu Atea. This is a reminder you don't have to complete all of these field trips. You will be completing um, two before the end of the course. We are gonna end today's lecture discussing Nam Maduo, the ceremonial center of Eastern Micronesia. Nama Dua is celebrated as one of the most remarkable engineering feats of Oceania. It is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Nama Dua is a series of more than 100 islets off the southeast coast of Ponape that were constructed with walls of basalt and coral boulders. These islets harbor the remains of stone palaces, temples, tombs, and residential domains built between 1200 and 1500 CE. These ruins represent the ceremonial center of the Saudlur dynasty, a vibrant period in Pacific Island culture. The huge scale of the edifices, their technical sophistication, and the concentration of megalithic structures bear testimony to complex social and religious practices of the island societies of the period. The site was also inscribed on the list of world heritage, in danger due to threats, notably the situation of waterways that is contributing to the unchecked growth of mangroves and undermining existing edifices. So watch this video to learn more. And this is the conclusion of module six. As a reminder, be, be sure to complete your quiz before Tuesday at 12 a.m.